Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics. And today I'm pleased to have with us Drs. Elizabeth Chorney from Penrad Imaging in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and Dr. Parvi Ramshandani from the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania Department of Radiology, who are two of the authors of one of our featured papers in the current May 2018 issue of Radiographics. Their paper is entitled Cross-Sectional Imaging of Urinary Sphincters, Penile Prostheses, and Other Devices in the Male Lower Genitourinary Tract. Welcome to our podcast, doctors. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having us. Thanks for doing this. Parvi, you know, it's clear uh, that the medical conditions of urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction are increasingly common conditions in the aging male population in the United States. How much imaging do you perform in your practice related to these conditions? Is it more that these are incidental findings on imaging studies that are performed for other indications? Or does imaging actually play a role in the direct evaluation of these sorts of procedures and devices? Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, just wanted to say we are really pleased to be doing this. And this is obviously a paper that um, meant, uh, meant a good deal to us because we have a lot of experience with it. Yes. Um, I think one of the reasons we are seeing more of these patients is that people are less bashful about getting um, help for these problems. Right. And uh, there is a whole array of options available uh, short of actually having devices and prostheses, which are um, the, probably the end of the line treatment for both um, fluorid incontinence, which can occur mostly in patients who have radical prostatectomy, but is also something that can be a complication of a benign um, prostatic um, urethral um, surgery. So. Um, both of those. And then, of course, um, uh, so those, um, that's incontinence and um, erectile dysfunction. Um, it certainly has something to do with the aging population and hypertension. And, um, and then all of the surgeries that we are offering patients um, to, uh, to deal with their um, malignancies in the lower GEO tract. So as far as imaging for once the patient has had um, some kind of surgical procedure, Imaging is really relegated now mostly to um, evaluation in patients who've had um, complications um, for direct imaging. So our uh, intent in writing this paper was that we see these devices very frequently on cross-sectional imaging, both on CT and MR. And, um, and most of the, we found not only residents and fellows, the trainees, but even faculty were quite unaware of what nature of device there was, you know, everything was lumped together as GU sphincter, which is not accurate, and or a penile prosthesis, which is not accurate either. And so we saw a need, you know, to have a paper like this out there. But I would say that most of the imaging that occurs is, um, is incidentally for these devices in men um, having, um, you know, imaging studies for other reasons. Sure. So thank you for that. So Parvi, we know the most common iatrogenic reason for urinary stress incontinence uh, is in men who have undergone prostatectomy for prostate cancer. Uh, let's take a look, if we can, at figure number one in your paper, uh, which shows the normal appearance of one of these artificial urinary sphincters, and then figure three, which shows the CT appearance of a normally functioning device. So um, uh, the figure 1A um, it is um, a cross-sectional axial CT of a normal artificial urinary sphincter. And what we are seeing there um, is uh, a pump in the, uh, in the right side of the scrotum, which is the long um, solid white arrow. And then um, this pump is something that the patient can feel and they are taught how to control the pump uh, to both activate and deactivate the sphincter for voiding. Uh, the, the cuff itself, which goes around the urethra is um, marked by the interrupted dashed arrow. And uh, the cuff um, um, is inflated around the urethra and maintains continence for these patients. And when they have to uh, avoid, um, they um, yeah, use the pump to deflate the cuff and, and then go ahead and avoid. So that's the CT. The next two images show um, the fluid filled reservoir in the right lower abdomen um, and the tubing to, for the cuff and the sphincter are connected to this fluid filled reservoir. And this, um, some parts of imaging, um, Jeff, pertaining to your first question, um, if there's a, a concern that the reservoir may be malfunctioning, 
ultrasound is actually quite effective in showing us um, a normally inflated um, reservoir, which should have this round appearance with approximately 20 to 25 ml of fluid within it. And uh, the final image is um, of, of figure 1C is uh, what the components of a normal artificial urinary sphincter, um, which um, shows the reservoir marked with an asterisk, then the tubing connecting um, to a cuff, which is the tubing and the cuff are all in the orange. The cuff looks kind of like a deflated donut, goes around the proximal bulbar urethra. And the solid arrow points to the um, pump, which is um, implanted in the in this scrotum. Terrific, thank you. Okay, sure, you're welcome. So, Parvi, next in the paper is a discussion of the use of the periurethral bulking agents for urinary stress incontinence management. Right. You mentioned that these agents are more readily seen on MR than on CT. Can we look at figure six, which I think nicely demonstrates this particular point? So while I'm bringing that up, um, the bulking agents were very popular about 10 years ago. And um, the technology with the artificial sphincters has really improved. And so um, the bulking agents, which are used in both females and males, but um, mostly in males, have um, have fallen somewhat out of favor now and are not as commonly used. So we probably will not see a lot of new patients with bulking agents, but certainly the, the patients who've had it done in the past, the agent hangs around forever. And so we fought, felt it was important for our readers to know uh, potentially what the appearance could be like so that it would not cause confusion because we've had instances where they were misinterpreted as being tumors. In fact, and it was just a, you know, an iatrogenic abnormality. So here we have um, on CT, and I think it shows you well how, why CT is um, not as good as MR for, for um, depiction of these agents. So on, on figure 6A, which is a CT through the lower pelvis, you can see the two arrows marking slight, um, what appears almost like thickening around the bladder neck urethral junction, which is really the bulking agent. And you will see, we see that much better on the MR where you can see the um, periurethral collagen, which is the usual bulking agent. They were also in the past, they have used um, radio opaque beads, small, they're made of PVC or polyvinyl particles. Those would be radio dense on CT. And actually you can sometimes see them on plain films as well. So um, here we can see the slight, um, slightly hyper intense uh, collagen on these T1 weighted images uh, relative to, and uh, similar to uh, muscle but much uh, denser than the urine within the urinary bladder. And then, which is figure 6B. And figure 6C shows us, again, this well-defined lumps of um, the collagen around the level of the bladder neck. And um, these should not demonstrate any enhancement, and that'd be one way to separate this um, abnormality from actual tumor recurrence. So, um, but this is a very typical appearance. The collagen could be a little bit lower in the urethra, and this patient is a little bit higher than, than usual. Great. Bobby, thank you so much. Elizabeth, okay. let's turn to you. Um, after brief discussions and illustrations of perineal slings and sacral nerve stimulators, the paper then focuses on erectile dysfunction, and in particular, the use of penile prostheses as the most commonly implanted devices uh, for medically refractory uh, cases. Uh, inflatable prostheses are the most common of these devices. And figure uh, 9A and B shows the MR appearance of such a device. And figure 10A and B, uh, the CT appearances. Can we review figures 9 and figure 10 and take us through these? Yeah, sure. Um, so the inflatable penile prosthesis has three main components, and that's the uh, reservoir, the balloon reservoir, the bilateral intercavernosal cylinders, and the scrotal pump. Um, and so figure 9A is a T1 coronal image um, through the male pelvis showing the uh, balloon reservoir in the right lower quadrant denoted by the dashed arrow. Um, and that's located in the previsicle space. Uh, these solid arrows are pointing to the bilateral intercavernosal cylinders located in the corpus cavernosa. And the uh, long dashed arrow showing the pump uh, located in the right hemiscrotum. And typically this will be on the same side as the reservoir placement. Figure 9B is a sagittal T2-weighted MRI image uh, showing uh, the inflatable penile prosthesis and the solid arrows pointing to the uh, intercavernosal cylinder, which has high signal intensity. Um, posteriorly to that, there is a short dashed arrow that shows a rear tip extender 
And the root tip extenders are used interoperatively to adjust the length of the, the penile prosthesis at time of implantation. Um, and then inferior to that, there's a long dash arrow just pointing to the um, scrotal pump. Uh, figures 10A and 10B are axial CT images uh, through two different uh, inflatable penile prostheses. Figure 10A, the solid arrow is pointing to the intercavernosal cylinder, which is hyperattenuating. Um, and that's because in this case, uh, radiopaque contrast was used to fill the system as opposed to normal saline. Um, posterior to the intercavernosal cylinders, there's the rear tip extenders. Uh, denoted by the dashed arrow. And then in figure B, uh, this is an example where normal saline was used uh, in this inflatable penile prosthesis. Um, and so that's uh, the solid arrows pointing to fluid attenuation within the right intercavernosal cylinder uh, because saline was used. Um, to the, the right side of that, there's um, short dashed arrows pointing to connective tubing, which will connect to the scrotal pump, which is not shown in this image. And then in, uh, posteriorly, you can see again, the rear tip extenders uh, denoted by the long dashed arrow. And in this case, there is a little bit of asymmetry of those uh, rear tip extenders, which is not um, an unexpected binding postoperatively. Terrific, thank you. Um, so in your paper, after a review of semi-rigid penile prostheses, your paper discusses complications of these devices and groups the complications into malposition, uh, device malfunction, and infection. Uh, regarding malposition, you make the point in the paper that non-customary reservoir placement of these devices should not be mistaken as reservoir malposition or migration. Can you discuss this? And we'll look at two figures that I think reinforce this distinction, which are figures 12 and figure 13. Mm -hmm. So the example that we showed in the paper, um, it was in regards to the balloon reservoir. And so typically the reservoirs are um, placed in the previsical space. Um, occasionally in patients that have had prior uh, pelvic surgery, such as a renal transplant or bilateral hernias or a cystectomy, um, that, that space may be difficult to access. In that case, the surgeon will decide to put it in a non-customary location. Um, and typically, that'll be along the posterior aspect of the rectus muscle and anterior to the transversalis fascia. And so that's um, basically what figure 12 is showing. It's an axial CT image. And you can see the uh, balloon reservoir denoted by the asterisk, which is filled with normal saline, um, located right up against the posterior aspect of the rectus muscle and then anterior to the transversalis fascia. And it's just important to recognize that if you see that, that it's not, um, you know, a complication of migration. It's just an expected postoperative change in that case. Um, you can compare that with figures 13 and 13, uh, 13A and 13B, which showed um, basically migration. So it, this is a rare complication. It doesn't often happen, but when it happens, it's most commonly going to migrate to the inguinal canal. And so on 13A, you can see a, a reservoir that was filled with normal saline that herniated into the right inguinal region. And then on figure 13B, um, there's a, a radiopaque uh, reservoir that her herniated into the left inguinal region. Great, thank you. And, and just, I just wanted to add also, you can see how the in 13A, the, uh, the reservoir has changed its um, configuration. So it's looking very malformed instead of being a nice round or uh, you know, round to oval, it's become um, kind of heart shaped and that's not uh, the expected appearance for a well-functioning, well-positioned reservoir. Great, thanks Parvi. So Elizabeth, uh, in further reviewing the complications of these devices, you detail device malfunction and you make an important point regarding evaluation of the reservoir to assess for possible leaks, uh, discontinuity of the components of the device, air within the device, which is abnormal and can lead to device malfunction, and hardware failure. Perhaps the most important complication uh, for the radiologist to recognize for these devices is infection, uh, which is associated with the device. Can you give us some idea of how imaging plays a role in the evaluation of potential infection? In other words, do you image patients for this particular complication, or is it easily recognized clinically and you evaluate uh, the patients that way? Uh, and as we get your answer, we'll also take a look at figure 21, which I think shows an example of an infection of one of these devices. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so typically when uh, patients have infection, um, it'll be clinically obvious uh, to, the, to the clinician. They'll present with uh, tenderness and, and pain uh, to the area with um, erythema, and it'll be warm to touch. There may be some drainage. And so uh, most oftentimes it'll be um, obvious to the, to the clinician. They don't necessarily need to order additional imaging. Um, in some cases, if a patient has vague symptoms or the clinical exam is a little bit equivocal, uh, I think then imaging will play a role um, to kind of look for ancillary findings of infection. 
Um, but most of the time, it, it's a more of a clinical diagnosis. Um, and then so for 21A uh, and 21B, um, this was an example of a tandem uh, uh, urethral sphincter that became infected. And so 21A is a coronal CT image, and you can see the radiopaque-filled uh, radio uh, uh, reservoir in the left lower quadrant. And uh, there is some volume averaging on this, on this image, but uh, there's adjacent tubing as well below that. And you can see this marked inflammatory stranding in the subcutaneous fat. Um, and there's overlying skin thickening adjacent to the two, uh, overlying skin thickening in that area. And then there's also a small focus of gas. Um, and th those are all kind of, uh, you know, findings that we'd expect to see in infection. 21B um, is the same patient, it's just a little bit lower and it's an axial image. Um, just showing marked again, marked subcutaneous edema and soft tissue edema in that area. Um, and then you can see a little bit of the scrotal pump and adjacent to the scrotal pump, there's a more focal area of low attenuation, which is a, a abscess. And then there's a, a few uh, dots of air adjacent to that as well. Right. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. So Drs. Chorney and Ramshandani, I want to thank you for taking the time today to discuss your paper on the cross-sectional imaging evaluation of devices of the male uh, genital urinary tract, which can be found in the current May 2018 issue of Radiographics. Ladies, thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you, thank you Jackie, thank you. for giving us the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye.